The Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain, Chapter Twelve, A Holiday Flight Through France, Summer Garb of the Landscape, Abroad on the Great Plains, Peculiarities of French Cars, French Politeness, American Railway Officials, Twenty Minutes to Dinner, Why There Are No Accidents, The Old Travelers, Still on the Wing, Paris at Last, French Order and Quiet, Place of the Bastille, Seeing the Sights, A Barbarous Atrocity, Absurd Billiards. We have come five hundred miles by rail through the heart of France. What a bewitching land it is! What a garden! Surely the leagues of bright green lawns are swept and brushed and watered every day, and their grasses trimmed by the barber. Surely the hedges are shaped and measured, and their symmetry preserved, by the most architectural of gardeners. Surely the long straight rows of stately poplars that divide the beautiful landscape like the squares of a checkerboard are set with line and plummet, and their uniform height determined with a spirit level. Surely the straight, smooth, pure white turnpikes are jack-planed and sandpapered every day. How else are these marvels of symmetry, cleanliness, and order retained? It is wonderful. There are no unsightly stone walls, and never a fence of any kind. There is no dirt, no decay, no rubbish anywhere, nothing that even hints at untidiness, nothing that ever suggests neglect. All is orderly and beautiful. Everything is charming to the eye. We had such glimpses of the Rhone gliding along between its grassy banks, of cosy cottages buried in flowers and shrubbery, of quaint old red-tiled villages with mossy medieval cathedrals looming out of their midst, of wooded hills with ivy-grown towers and turrets of feudal castles projecting above the foliage, such glimpses of paradise it seemed to us, such visions of fabled fairyland. We knew then what the poet meant when he sang of Thy cornfields green and sunny vines, O pleasant land of France. And it is a pleasant land. No word describes it so felicitously as that one. They say there is no word for home in the French language. Well, considering that they have the article itself in such an attractive aspect, they ought to manage to get along without the word. Let us not waste too much pity on homeless France. I have observed that Frenchmen abroad seldom wholly give up the idea of going back to France some time or other. I am not surprised at it now. We are not infatuated with these French railway cars, though. We took first-class passage, not because we wish to attract attention by doing a thing which is uncommon in Europe, but because we could make our journey quicker by so doing. It is hard to make railroading pleasant in any country. It is too tedious. Stage-coaching is infinitely more delightful. Once I crossed the plains and deserts and mountains of the West in a stage-coach from the Missouri line to California, and since then all my pleasure trips must be measured to that rare holiday frolic. Two thousand miles of ceaseless rush and rattle and clatter, by night and by day, and never a weary moment, never a lapse of interest. The first seven hundred miles a level continent, its grassy carpet greener and softer and smoother than any sea, and figured with designs fitted to its magnitude, the shadow of the clouds. Here were no scenes but summer scenes, and no disposition inspired by them but to lie at full length on the mail sacks in the grateful breeze, and dreamily smoke the pipe of peace. What other? where all was repose and contentment. In cool mornings before the sun was fairly up it was worth a lifetime of city toiling and moiling to perch in the foretop with a driver, and see the six mustangs scamper under the sharp snapping of the whip that never touched them, to scan the blue distances of a world that knew no lords but us, to cleave the wind with uncovered head and feel the sluggish pulses rousing to the spirit of a speed that pretended to the resistless rush of a typhoon. Then thirteen hundred miles of desert solitudes, of limitless panoramas of bewildering perspective, 
of mimic cities, of pinnacled cathedrals, of massive fortresses, counterfeited in the eternal rocks, and splendid with the crimson and gold of the setting sun, of dizzy altitudes among fog-wreathed peaks, and never-melting snows, where thunders and lightnings and tempests warred magnificently at our feet, and the storm-clouds above swung their shredded banners in our very faces. But I forgot. I am in elegant France now, and not scurrying through the great South Pass and the Wind River Mountains, among antelopes and buffaloes and painted Indians on the warpath. It is not meet that I should make two disparaging comparisons between humdrum travel on a railway and that royal summer flight across a continent in a stage-coach. I meant in the beginning to say that railway journeying is tedious and tiresome, and so it is though at the time I was thinking particularly of a dismal fifty-hour pilgrimage between New York and St. Louis. Of course, our trip through France was not really tedious, because all its scenes and experiences were new and strange. But as Dan says, it had its discrepancies. The cars are built in compartments that hold eight persons each. Each compartment is partially subdivided, and so there are two tolerably distinct parties of four in it. Four face the other four. The seats and backs are thickly padded and cushioned, and are very comfortable. You can smoke if you wish. There are no bothersome peddlers. You are saved the infliction of a multitude of disagreeable fellow-passengers. So far, so well. But then the conductor locks you in when the train starts. There is no water to drink in the car. There is no heating apparatus for night travel. If a drunken rowdy should get in, you could not remove a matter of twenty seats from him, or enter another car. But above all, if you are worn out and must sleep, you must sit up and do it in naps, with cramped legs, and in a torturing misery that leaves you withered and lifeless the next day. For, behold, they have not that culmination of all charity and human kindness, a sleeping-car, in all France. I prefer the American system. It has not so many grievous discrepancies. In France all is clockwork, all is order. They make no mistakes. Every third man wears a uniform, and whether he be a marshal of the empire or a brakeman, he is ready and perfectly willing to answer all your questions with tireless politeness ready to tell you which car to take, yea, and ready to go and put you into it, to make sure that you shall not go astray. You cannot pass into the waiting-room of the depot till you have secured your ticket, and you cannot pass from its only exit till the train is at its threshold to receive you. Once on board the train will not start till your ticket has been examined, till every passenger's ticket has been inspected. This is chiefly for your own good. If by any possibility you have managed to take the wrong train, you will be handed over to a polite official who will take you whither you belong, and bestow you with many an affable bow. Your ticket will be inspected every now and then along the route, and when it is time to change cars you will know it. You are in the hands of officials who zealously study your welfare and your interest, instead of turning their talents to the invention of new methods of discommoding and snubbing you as is very often the main employment of that exceedingly self-satisfied monarch, the railroad conductor of America. But the happiest regulation in French railway government is thirty minutes to dinner. No five-minute boltings of flabby rolls, muddy coffee, questionable eggs, gutta percha beef, and pies whose conception and execution are a dark and bloody mystery to all save the cook that created them, no, we sat calmly down, it was in Old Dijon, which is so easy to spell and so impossible to pronounce, except when you civilize it and call it Demijohn, and poured out rich Burgundian wines and munched calmly through a long table d'hote bill of fare, snail patties, delicious fruits and all, then paid the trifle it cost and stepped happily aboard the train again, without once cursing the railroad company a rare experience, and one to be treasured for ever. They say they do not have accidents on these French roads, and I think it must be true. If I remember rightly, we passed high above wagon roads, or through tunnels under them, but never crossed them on their own level. 
About every quarter of a mile, it seemed to me, a man came out and held up a club till the train went by to signify that everything was safe ahead. Switches were changed a mile in advance by pulling a wire rope that passed along the ground by the rail from station to station. Signals for the day and signals for the night gave constant and timely notice of the position of switches. No, they have no railroad accidents to speak of in France. But why? Because when one occurs, somebody has to hang for it. Not hang, maybe, but be punished at least with such vigor of emphasis as to make negligence a thing to be shuddered at by railroad officials for many a day thereafter. No blame attached to the officers. That lying and disaster-breeding verdict, so common to our soft-hearted juries, is seldom rendered in France. If the trouble occurred in the conductor's department, that officer must suffer if his subordinate cannot be proven guilty. If in the engineer's department, and the case be similar, the engineer must answer. The old travellers, those delightful parrots who have been here before, and know more about the country than Louis Napoleon knows now or ever will know, tell us these things, and we believe them because they are pleasant things to believe, and because they are plausible and savour of the rigid subjection to law and order which we behold about us everywhere. But we love the old travellers. We love to hear them prate and drivel and lie. We can tell them the moment we see them. They always throw out a few feelers. They never cast themselves adrift till they have sounded every individual and know that he has not travelled. Then they open their throttle valves, and how they do brag, and sneer, and swell, and soar, and blaspheme the sacred name of truth. Their central idea, their grand aim, is to subjugate you, keep you down, make you feel insignificant and humble in the blaze of their cosmopolitan glory. They will not let you know anything. They sneer at your most inoffensive suggestions. They laugh unfeelingly at your treasured dreams of foreign lands. They brand the statements of your travelled aunts and uncles as the stupidest absurdities. They deride your most trusted authors, and demolish the fair images they have set up for your willing worship with the pitiless ferocity of the fanatic iconoclast. But still I love the old travellers. I love them for their witless platitudes, for their supernatural ability to bore, for their delightful asinine vanity, for their luxuriant fertility of imagination, for their startling, their brilliant, their overwhelming mendacity. By Lyon and the Soane, where we saw the Lady of Lyon and thought little of her comeliness, by Villafranca, Tonnerre, Venerable Sainz, Melun, Fontainebleau, and scores of other beautiful cities, we swept always noting the absence of hog-wallows, broken fences, cow-lots, unpainted houses, and mud, and always noting, as well, the presence of cleanliness, grace, taste in adoring and beautifying, even to the disposition of a tree or the turning of a hedge, the marvel of roads in perfect repair, void of ruts and guiltless of even an inequality of surface, we bowled along hour after hour that brilliant summer day, and as nightfall approached we entered a wilderness of odorous flowers and shrubbery, sped through it, and then, excited and delighted, and half persuaded that we were only the sport of a beautiful dream, lo, we stood in magnificent Paris. What excellent order they kept about that vast depot! There was no frantic crowding and jostling, no shouting and swearing, and no swaggering intrusion of services by rowdy hackmen. These latter gentry stood outside, stood quietly by their long line of vehicles, and said never a word. A kind of hackman general seemed to have the whole matter of transportation in his hands. He politely received the passengers, and ushered them to the kind of conveyance they wanted, and told the driver where to deliver them. There was no talking back, no dissatisfaction about overcharging, no grumbling about anything. In a little while we were speeding through the streets of Paris, and delightfully recognizing certain names and places with which books had long ago made us familiar. It was like meeting an old friend when we read Rue de Rivoli on the street corner. We knew the genuine vast palace of the Louvre as well as we knew its picture. 
When we passed by the Column of July, we needed no one to tell us what it was, or to remind us that on its site once stood the grim Bastille, that grave of human hopes and happiness, that dismal prison-house within whose dungeons so many young faces put on the wrinkles of age, so many proud spirits grew humble, so many brave hearts broke. We secured rooms at the hotel, or rather we had three beds put into one room, so that we might be together, and then we went out to a restaurant just after lamplighting, and ate a comfortable, satisfactory, lingering dinner. It was a pleasure to eat where everything was so tidy, the food so well cooked, the waiters so polite, and the coming and departing company so moustached, so frisky, so affable, so fearfully and wonderfully Frenchy. All the surroundings were gay and enlivening. Two hundred people sat at little tables on the sidewalk, sipping wine and coffee. The streets were thronged with light vehicles and with joyous pleasure-seekers. There was music in the air, life and action all about us, and a conflagration of gaslight everywhere. After dinner we felt like seeing such Parisian specialties as we might see without distressing exertion, and so we sauntered through the brilliant streets and looked at the dainty trifles in variety stores and jewelry shops. Occasionally, merely for the pleasure of being cruel, we put unoffending Frenchmen on the rack with questions framed in the incomprehensible jargon of their native language, and while they writhed we impaled them, we peppered them, we sacrificed them with their own vile verbs and participles. We noticed that in the jewelry stores they had some of the articles marked gold, and some labeled imitation. We wondered at this extravagance of honesty, and inquired into the matter. We were informed that inasmuch as most people are not able to tell false gold from the genuine article, the government compels jewelers to have their gold work assayed, and stamped officially according to its fineness, and their imitation work duly labeled with the sign of its falsity. They told us the jewelers would not dare to violate this law, and that whatever a stranger bought in one of their stores might be depended upon as being strictly what it was represented to be. Verily, a wonderful land is France. Then we hunted for a barber shop. From earliest infancy it had been a cherished ambition of mine to be shaved some day in a palatial barber shop in Paris. I wished to recline at full length in a cushioned invalid chair, with pictures about me and sumptuous furniture, with frescoed walls and gilded arches above me, and vistas of Corinthian columns stretching far before me with perfumes of Araby to intoxicate my senses, and the slumbrous drone of distant noises to soothe me to sleep. At the end of an hour I would wake up regretfully and find my face as smooth and as soft as an infant's. Departing, I would lift my hands above that barber's head and say, Heaven bless you, my son. So we searched high and low, for a matter of two hours, but never a barber shop could we see. We saw only wig-making establishments, with shocks of dead and repulsive hair bound upon the heads of painted waxen brigands, who stared out from glass boxes upon the passer-by, with their stony eyes, and scared him with the ghostly white of their countenances. We shunned these signs for a time, but finally we concluded that the wig-makers must of necessity be the barbers as well, since we could find no single legitimate representative of the fraternity. We entered and asked, and found, that it was even so. I said I wanted to be shaved. The barber inquired where my room was. I said, never mind where my room was, I wanted to be shaved, there on the spot. The doctor said he would be shaved also. Then there was an excitement among those two barbers. There was a wild consultation, and afterwards a hurrying to and fro, and a feverish gathering up of razors from obscure places, and a ransacking for soap. Next they took us into a little mean shabby back room. They got two ordinary sitting-room chairs, and placed us in them with our coats on. My old, old dream of bliss vanished into thin air. I sat bolt upright, silent, sad, and solemn. One of the wig-making villains lathered my face for ten terrible minutes, and finished by plastering a mass of suds into my mouth. I expelled the nasty stuff with a strong English expletive, and said, "'Foreigner, beware!' Then this outlaw strapped his razor on his boot. 
hovered over me ominously for six fearful seconds, and then swooped down upon me like the genius of destruction. The first rake of his razor loosened the very hide from my face and lifted me out of the chair. I stormed and raved, and the other boys enjoyed it. Their beards are not strong and thick. Let us draw the curtain over this harrowing scene. Suffice it that I submitted and went through with the cruel infliction of a shave by a French barber. Tears of exquisite agony coursed down my cheeks now and then, but I survived. Then the incipient assassin held a basin of water under my chin, and slopped its contents over my face, and into my bosom, and down the back of my neck, with a mean pretense of washing away the soap and blood. He dried my features with a towel, and was going to comb my hair, but I asked to be excused. I said, with withering irony, that it was sufficient to be skinned, I declined to be scalped. I went away from there with my handkerchief about my face, and never, never, never desired to dream of palatial Parisian barber-shops any more. The truth is, as I believe I have since found out, that they have no barber-shops worthy of the name in Paris, and no barbers either, for that matter. The impostor who does duty as a barber brings his pans and napkins and implements of torture to your residence, and deliberately skins you in your private apartments. Ah, I have suffered, suffered, suffered here in Paris, but never mind, the time is coming when I shall have a dark and bloody revenge. Some day a Parisian barber will come to my room to skin me, and from that day forth that barber will never be heard of more. At eleven o'clock we alighted upon a sign which manifestly referred to billiards. Joy! We had played billiards in the Azores with balls that were not round and on an ancient table that was very little smoother than a brick pavement, one of those wretched old things with dead cushions, and with patches in the faded cloth and invisible obstructions that made the balls describe the most astonishing and unsuspected angles, and perform feats in the way of unlooked-for and almost impossible scratches that were perfectly bewildering. We had played at Gibraltar with balls the size of a walnut, on a table like a public square and in both instances we achieved far more aggravation than amusement. We expected to fare better here, but we were mistaken. The cushions were a good deal higher than the balls, and, as the balls had a fashion of always stopping under the cushions, we accomplished very little in the way of caroms. The cushions were hard and unelastic, and the cues were so crooked that in making a shot you had to allow for the curve or he would infallibly put the English on the wrong side of the ball. Dan was to mark while the doctor and I played. At the end of an hour neither of us had made a count, and so Dan was tired of keeping tally with nothing to tally, and we were heated and angry and disgusted. We paid the heavy bill, about six cents, and said we would call around some time when we had a week to spend, and finish the game. We adjourned to one of those pretty cafés, and took supper, and tested the wines of the country, as we had been instructed to do, and found them harmless and unexciting. They might have been exciting, however, if we had chosen to drink a sufficiency of them. To close our first day in Paris cheerfully and pleasantly, we now sought our grand room in the Grand Hotel du Louvre, and climbed into our sumptuous bed to read and smoke. But alas! It was pitiful, in a whole city full, gas we had none. No gas to read by, nothing but dismal candles. It was a shame. We tried to map out excursions for the morrow, we puzzled over French guides to Paris, we talked disjointedly in a vain endeavor to make a head or tail of the wild chaos of the day's sights and experiences. We subsided to indolent smoking. We gaped and yawned and stretched, then feebly wondered if we were really and truly in renowned Paris, and drifted drowsily away into that vast mysterious void which men call sleep. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 More Trouble Monsieur Billfinger Rechristening the Frenchman In the Clutches of a Paris Guide the International Exposition, Fine Military Review, Glimpse of the Emperor Napoleon, and the Sultan of Turkey. 
The next morning we were up and dressed at ten o'clock. We went to the commissionnaire of the hotel, I don't know what a commissionnaire is, but that is the man we went to, and told him we wanted a guide. He said the National Exposition had drawn such multitudes of Englishmen and Americans to Paris that it would be next to impossible to find a good guide unemployed. He said he usually kept a dozen or two on hand, but he only had three now. He called them. One looked so like a very pirate that we let him go at once. The next one spoke with a simpering precision of pronunciation that was irritating, and said, "'If the gentleman's will be to me make the grand honour to me retain in his service, I shall show to him everything that is magnifique to look upon in the beautiful Paris. I speak the English parfaitement.' He would have done well to have stopped there, because he had that much by heart and said it right off without making a mistake. But his self-complacency seduced him into attempting a flight into regions of unexplored English, and the reckless experiment was his ruin. Within ten seconds he was so tangled up in a maze of mutilated verbs and torn and bleeding forms of speech that no human ingenuity could ever have gotten him out of it with credit. It was plain enough that he could not speak the English quite as parfaitement as he had pretended he could. The third man captured us. He was plainly dressed, but he had a noticeable air of neatness about him. He wore a high silk hat, which was a little old, but had been carefully brushed. He wore second-hand kid gloves, in good repair, and carried a small rattan cane with a curved handle, a female leg, of ivory. He stepped as gently and as daintily as a cat crossing a muddy street. And, oh, he was urbanity! He was quiet, unobtrusive self-possession. He was deference itself. He spoke softly and guardedly, and when he was about to make a statement on his sole responsibility or offer a suggestion, he weighed it by drams and scruples first, with a crook of his little stick placed meditatively to his teeth. His opening speech was perfect. It was perfect in construction, in phraseology, in grammar, in emphasis, in pronunciation, everything. He spoke little and guardedly after that. We were charmed. We were more than charmed. We were overjoyed. We hired him at once. We never even asked him his price. This man, our lackey, our servant, our unquestioning slave, though he was, was still a gentleman. We could see that while of the other two one was coarse and awkward, and the other was a born pirate. We asked our man Friday's name. He drew from his pocket-book a snowy little card, and passed it to us with a profound bow. A. Billfinger. Guide to Paris, France, Germany, Spain, etc., etc. Grand Hotel du Louvre. Billfinger! Oh, carry me home to die! That was an aside from Dan. The atrocious name grated harshly on my ear, too. The most of us can learn to forgive, and even to like, a countenance that strikes us unpleasantly at first, but few of us, I fancy, become reconciled to a jarring name so easily. I was almost sorry we had hired this man. His name was so unbearable. However, no matter, we were impatient to start. Billfinger stepped to the door to call a carriage, and then the doctor said, well, the guide goes with the barber shop, with the billiard table, with the gasless room, and may be with many another pretty romance of Paris. I expected to have a guide named Henri de Montmorency, or Armand de la Chartreuse, or something that would sound grand in letters to the villagers at home. But to think of a Frenchman by the name of Billfinger, oh, this is absurd, you know. This will never do. We can't say Billfinger. It is nauseating. Name him over again. What had we better call him? Alexis du Colincourt? Alphonse Henri Gustave de Hauteville, I suggested. Call him Ferguson, said Dan. That was practical, unromantic good sense. Without debate we expunged Billfinger as Billfinger, and called him Ferguson. The carriage, an open barouche, was ready. Ferguson mounted beside the driver, and we whirled away to breakfast. As was proper, Mr. Ferguson stood by to transmit our orders and answer questions. 
By and by he mentioned casually, the artful adventurer, that he would go and get his breakfast as soon as we had finished ours. He knew we could not get along without him, and that we would not want to loiter about and wait for him. We asked him to sit down and eat with us. He begged, with many a bow, to be excused. It was not proper, he said. He would sit at another table. We ordered him peremptorily to sit down with us. Here endeth the first lesson. It was a mistake. As long as we had that fellow after that, he was always hungry. He was always thirsty. He came early. He stayed late. He could not pass a restaurant. He looked with a lecherous eye upon every wine-shop. Suggestions to stop, excuses to eat and to drink, were forever on his lips. We tried all we could to fill him so full that he would have no room to spare for a fortnight, but it was a failure. He did not hold enough to smother the cravings of his superhuman appetite. He had another discrepancy about him. He was always wanting us to buy things. On the shallowest pretenses, he would inveigle us into shirt-stores, boot-stores, tailor-shops, glove-shops, anywhere under the broad sweep of the heavens, that there seemed a chance of our buying anything. Anyone could have guessed that the shopkeepers paid him a percentage on the sales. But in our blessed innocence we didn't, until this feature of his conduct grew unbearably prominent. One day Dan happened to mention that he thought of buying three or four silk dress patterns for presents. Ferguson's eye was upon him in an instant. In the course of twenty minutes the carriage stopped. "'What's this?' "'This is the finest silk magasin in Paris, the most celebrate. "'What did you come here for? We told you to take us to the Palace of the Louvre. "'I suppose the gentlemen say he wished to buy some silk?' "'You are not required to suppose things for the party, Ferguson. "'We do not wish to tax your energies too much. "'We will bear some of the burden and heat of the day ourselves. "'We will endeavor to do such supposing as is really necessary to be done. "'Drive on.' "'So spake the doctor. "'Within fifteen minutes the carriage halted again, "'and before another silk store. "'The doctor said, Ah, the palace of the Louvre! Beautiful, beautiful edifice! Does the Emperor Napoleon live here now, Ferguson? Ah, doctor, you do jest. This is not the palace. We come there directly. But since we pass right by the store, where is such beautiful silk? Ah, I see, I see. I meant to have told you that we did not wish to purchase any silks today, but in my absent-mindedness I forgot. I also meant to tell you we wish to go directly to the Louvre, but I forgot that also. However, we will go there now. Pardon my seeming carelessness, Ferguson. Drive on." Within the half-hour we stopped again, in front of another silk store. We were angry, but the doctor was always serene, always smooth-voiced, and he said, "'At last! How imposing the Louvre is, and yet how small! How exquisitely fashioned! How charmingly situated! Venerable, venerable pile! Pardon, doctor, this is not the Louvre. It is— What is it? I have the idea. It come to me in a moment, that the silk in this magasin— Ferguson, how heedless I am! I fully intended to tell you that we did not wish to buy any silks today, and I also intended to tell you that we yearned to go immediately to the palace of the Louvre. But enjoying the happiness of seeing you devour four breakfasts this morning has so filled me with pleasurable emotions that I neglect the commonest interests of the time. However, we will proceed now to the Louvre, Ferguson. But, doctor, excitedly, it will take not a minute, not but one small minute. The gentleman need not to buy if he does not wish to, but only to look at the silk, look at the beautiful fabric. Then pleadingly, Sir, just only one little moment. Dan said, Confound the idiot! I don't want to see any silks today, and I won't look at them. Drive on. And the doctor, We need no silks now, Ferguson. Our hearts yearn for the Louvre. Let us journey on. Let us journey on. But, doctor, it is only one moment, one little moment, and the time will be save, entirely save. 
because there is nothing to see now. It is too late. It want ten minutes to four, and the Louvre close at four. Only one little moment, doctor. The treacherous miscreant, after four breakfasts and a gallon of champagne, to serve us such a scurvy trick. We got no sight of the countless treasures of art in the Louvre galleries that day, and our only poor little satisfaction was in the reflection that Ferguson sold not a solitary silk-dress pattern. I am writing this chapter partly for the satisfaction of abusing that accomplished knave Billfinger, and partly to show whosoever shall read this how Americans fare at the hands of the Paris guides, and what sort of people Paris guides are. It need not be supposed that we were a stupider or an easier prey than our countrymen generally are, for we were not. The guides deceive and defraud every American who goes to Paris for the first time, and sees its sights alone or in company with others as little experienced as himself. I shall visit Paris again some day, and then let the guides beware. I shall go in my war-paint. I shall carry my tomahawk along. I think we have lost but little time in Paris. We have gone to bed every night tired out. Of course we visited the renowned International Exposition. All the world did that. We went there on our third day in Paris, and we stayed there nearly two hours. That was our first and last visit. To tell the truth, we saw at a glance that one would have to spend weeks, yea, even months, in that monstrous establishment to get an intelligible idea of it. It was a wonderful show, but the moving masses of people of all nations we saw there were a still more wonderful show. I discovered that if I were to stay there a month, I should still find myself looking at the people instead of the inanimate objects on exhibition. I got a little interested in some curious old tapestries of the thirteenth century, but a party of Arabs came by, and their dusky faces and quaint costumes called my attention away at once. I watched a silver swan, which had a living grace about his movements and a living intelligence in his eyes, watched him swimming about as comfortably and as unconcernedly as if he had been born in a morass instead of a jeweler's shop, watched him seize a silver fish from under the water and hold up his head and go through all the customary and elaborate motions of swallowing it. But the moment it disappeared down his throat some tattooed South Sea Islanders approached me and I yielded to their attractions. Presently I found a revolving pistol, several hundred years old, which looked strangely like a modern colt, but just then I heard that the Empress of the French was in another part of the building, and hastened away to see what she might look like. We heard martial music. We saw an unusual number of soldiers walking hurriedly about. There was a general movement among the people. We inquired what it was all about, and learned that the Emperor of the French and the Sultan of Turkey were about to review twenty-five thousand troops at the Arc de l'Etoile. We immediately departed. I had a greater anxiety to see these men than I could have had to see twenty expositions. We drove away and took up a position in an open space opposite the American minister's house. A speculator bridged a couple of barrels with a board, and we hired standing places on it. Presently there was a sound of distant music. In another minute a pillar of dust came moving slowly toward us. A moment more, and then, with colors flying and a grand crash of military music, a gallant array of cavalrymen emerged from the dust and came down the street on a gentle trot. After them came a long line of artillery, then more cavalry in splendid uniforms, and then their Imperial Majesties Napoleon III and Abdul Aziz. The vast concourse of people swung their hats and shouted. The windows and housetops in the wide vicinity burst into a snowstorm of waving handkerchiefs, and the wavers of the same mingled their cheers with those of the masses below. It was a stirring spectacle. But the two central figures claimed all my attention. Was ever such a contrast set up before a multitude till then, Napoleon in military uniform? a long-bodied, short-legged man, fiercely moustached, old, wrinkled, with eyes half-closed, and such a deep, crafty, scheming expression about them. Napoleon, bowing ever so gently to the loud plaudits, and watching everything and everybody with his cat-eyes from under his depressed hat-brim, 
as if to discover any sign that those cheers were not heartfelt and cordial. Abdul Aziz, absolute lord of the Ottoman Empire, clad in dark green European clothes, almost without ornament or insignia of rank, a red Turkish fez on his head, a short, stout, dark man, black-bearded, black-eyed, stupid, unprepossessing, a man whose whole appearance somehow suggested that if he only had a cleaver in his hand and a white apron on, one would not be at all surprised to hear him say, A mutton roast to-day, or will you have a nice porterhouse steak? Napoleon the Third, the representative of the highest modern civilization, progress, and refinement, Abdul Aziz, the representative of a people by nature and training filthy, brutish, ignorant, unprogressive, superstitious, and a government whose three graces are tyranny, rapacity, blood. Here, in brilliant Paris, under this majestic arch of triumph, the first century greets the nineteenth. Napoleon the Third, Emperor of France, surrounded by shouting thousands, by military pomp, by the splendors of his capital city, and companioned by kings and princes. This is the man who was sneered at and reviled and called bastard, yet who was dreaming of a crown and an empire all the while, who was driven into exile, but carried his dreams with him, who associated with a common herd in America and ran foot-races for a wager, but still sat upon a throne in fancy, who braved every danger to go to his dying mother, and grieved that she could not be spared to see him cast aside his plebeian vestments for the purple of royalty, who kept his faithful watch and walked his weary beat a common policeman of London, but dreamed the while of a coming night when he should tread the long-drawn corridors of the Tuileries, who made the miserable fiasco of Strasbourg, saw his poor shabby eagle, forgetful of its lesson, refuse to perch upon his shoulder, delivered his carefully prepared, sententious burst of eloquence upon unsympathetic ears, found himself a prisoner, the butt of small wits, a mark for the pitiless ridicule of all the world, yet went on dreaming of coronations and splendid pageants as before, who lay a forgotten captive in the dungeons of Hum, and still schemed and planned and pondered over future glory and future power. President of France at last, a coup d'état, and surrounded by applauding armies, welcomed by the thunders of cannon, he mounts a throne and waves before an astounded world the scepter of a mighty empire. Who talks of the marvels of fiction? Who speaks of the wonders of romance? Who prates of the tame achievements of Aladdin and the Magi of Arabia? Abdul Aziz, Sultan of Turkey, Lord of the Ottoman Empire, born to a throne, weak, stupid, ignorant almost as his meanest slave, chief of a vast royalty, yet the puppet of his premier, and the obedient child of a tyrannical mother, a man who sits upon a throne, the beck of whose finger moves navies and armies, who holds in his hands the power of life and death over millions, yet who sleeps, sleeps, eats, eats, idles with his eight hundred concubines, and when he is surfeited with eating and sleeping and idling, and would rouse up and take the reins of government and threaten to be a sultan, is charmed from his purpose by wary Faud Pacha, with a pretty plan for a new palace or a new ship, charmed away with a new toy, like any other restless child a man who sees his people robbed and oppressed by soulless tax-gatherers, but speaks no word to save them, who believes in gnomes and genii, and the wild fables of the Arabian Nights, but has small regard for the mighty magicians of to-day, and is nervous in the presence of their mysterious railroads and steamboats and telegraphs, who would see undone in Egypt all that great Mehemet Ali achieved, and would prefer rather to forget than emulate him a man who found his great empire a blot upon the earth, a degraded, poverty-stricken, miserable, infamous agglomeration of ignorance, crime, and brutality, and will idle away the allotted days of his trivial life, and then pass to the dust and the worms, and leave it so. Napoleon has augmented the commercial prosperity of France in ten years to such a degree that figures can hardly compute it. He has rebuilt Paris, and has partly rebuilt every city in the state. 
he condemns a whole street at a time, assesses the damage, pays them, and rebuilds superbly. Then speculators buy up the ground and sell, but the original owner is given the first choice by the government at a stated price before the speculator is permitted to purchase. But above all things he has taken the sole control of the empire of France into his hands, and made it a tolerably free land, for people who will not attempt to go too far in meddling with government affairs. No country offers greater security to life and property than France and one has all the freedom he wants, but no license, no license to interfere with anybody or make anyone uncomfortable. As for the Sultan, one could set a trap anywhere and catch a dozen abler men in a night. The band struck up, and the brilliant adventurer, Napoleon III, the genius of energy, persistence, enterprise, and the feeble Abdulaziz, the genius of ignorance, bigotry, and indolence, prepared for the forward march. We saw the splendid review. We saw the white-mustached old Crimean soldier, Can Robert, Marshal of France. We saw, well, we saw everything, and then we went home satisfied. End of chapter 13